All right, you guys, Tom Woods has been trying to get me to do this forever on Facebook, but I hate Facebook, but now I'm going to do it on Reddit instead. Anyone who donates a monthly subscription donation at paypal.com or at patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show will uh, get a ticket to join up my new private Reddit group at r slash Scott Horton Show. Just uh, email me and I'll get you set up. Any single PayPal donation of $50 will get you a signed copy of my book, Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan. And a $100 donation will get you either a QR code silver commodity disc or a lifetime subscription to listen and think audiobooks. Of course, I accept all kinds of digital currencies as well. You can find out all this stuff at scotthorton.org slash donate. And of course, don't forget to shop amazon.com by way of my link. And give me a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or Amazon if you read the book and liked it. Thanks. Sorry, I'm late. I had to stop by the Wax Museum again and give the finger to FDR. We know Al-Qaeda, Zawahiri, is supporting the opposition in Syria. Are we supporting Al-Qaeda in Syria? It's a proud day for America. And by God, we've kicked Vietnam Syndrome once and for all. Thank you very, very much. I say it, I say it again. You've been had. You've been took. You've been hoodwinked. These witnesses are trying to simply deny things that just about everybody else accepts as fact. He came, he saw, he died. But we ain't killing their army, but we killing them. We be on CNN like, say our name, Ben, say it. Say it three times. The meeting of the largest armies in the history of the world. Then there's going to be an invasion. All right, you guys, introducing the great Andrew Coburn, uh, Washington editor at Harper's Magazine, author of the book Kill Chain, and most famously now, uh, although a little bit older, the book Dangerous Liaison, about America's relationship with Israel, and he's also uh, written about Iraq and... um, what was before Kill Chain for some reason? I'm sorry, I'm spacing out. Andrew, welcome before back. Before Kill before Kill Chain, before Kill Oh, the threat where I uh Oh the threat I about the Soviets. That was the days the height of the Cold War and the Russians were meant to be all over us and ten feet tall and I mm-hmm. pointed out this really wasn't wasn't true. Right. And what about Iraq that you wrote with Patrick back in the nineties, right? Uh yeah, what was it called? Out of the uh, Out of the Ashes mm-hmm. it was called. It was about Iraq. It was really a it was a biography of Saddam, really. Uh, Saddam Hussein, remember him? Um, yeah, he was going to attack us if we don't attack him first. Well, absolutely, because he had all those nuclear and weapons and chemical weapons, weapons of mass destruction, which he was ready to rain on, down on. Can- <laughs> That's, uh, anyway, <laughs> that shows you should always believe American and intel- U.S. intelligence. Right. Uh, you sure can, and and you better not contradict them, or you're guilty of treason. Absolutely, and they'll mm-hmm. haul you off in chains, which is probably what's about to happen. Yeah, uh, I guess we'll see. <laughs> I'm going to be in the concentration camp with all my favorite writers, so I don't really mind that much. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I want the bunk with the, by the window. Yeah, exactly. I just hope Bovard doesn't snore. That's all. Um. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> One more thing to worry about. Yeah, uh, yeah. All right, so listen, uh, you write great stuff, man. I'm a big fan of your brother, Patrick. Yeah, I really liked Alex, too, uh, founder of Counterpunch, of course, uh, your late brother, Alex Coburn. But uh, Patrick, of course, is the most important journalist in the world, uh, covering the wars for us for the independent and all that. And I interview him all the time. But you really write some great stuff, too. Um, tends to be more long-form uh, type journalism rather than war dispatches like Patrick. So you guys complement each other very well, I think, um, in your talents there. And this one is in harpers.org. How to start a nuclear war. Apparently, it's really easy. Yeah, kind of horrifying, really. Um, I mean, I tell the story, you know, it starts off with this guy, Bruce Blair, who was in a missile silo uh, in the early 70s, bored out of his mind, like most of them. Um, And he figured out how to launch not just his own unit, his own squadron, which was 50 missiles, um, 60 megatons, uh, which would have killed a few hundred million people, but how to launch the entire U.S. nuclear arsenal, Um, basically how to blow up the world in one one easy motion. And you say he was a first lieutenant in the Air Force. 
Right, and he pointed out to me, I should have made it more clear, that there were he was a first lieutenant, but there were people who were in the same position who were second lieutenants straight out of college. You know, you graduate, you throw your, you know, your cap in the air, what all, and then a few few months later, you're sitting in front of, you know, missile silo, you know, with the means to blow up the world. All right, now, so um, if I know TV, then I know then that means that, well, he would have had to pull a gun on his buddy and force him to turn the key at the same time, and they'd be able to launch maybe one missile. So what are you talking about? Well, he would have had to knock out, unless his partner... Um, in the silo was was in on the scheme he could uh, he's had to knock him out or you know slip a sleeping pill in his coffee or something anyway he has to restrain him in some way but once he's done that what he needs is there have to be two of them he needs a guy in another silo uh and once he has that then the whole you know it's open season mm-hmm. and it's because, not just okay i'm sorry go, go ahead no you go ahead I was going to say, so it's not just that if one guy in one silo and one guy in another silo can control those two missiles, but then working together, they have access to the whole network? They have access to the whole squadron, to 50 missiles. Mm -hmm. And if one of them is in the command silo for the squadron, it was like a special one, which is because there were five launch control centers for each squadron. Mm -hmm. So if if one of them is in this special silo, which kind of, oversaw the rest, then they two together could launch, as I said, not just the missiles in that squadron, not just the missiles in that base, which was already several hundred, but the whole U.S. nuclear arsenal. I mean, the bombers would probably, the bombers probably wouldn't have, would have checked and wouldn't have done it, but the, the rest would go off, certainly the land-based missiles, which was 1,054, um, would go off without recall. Yeah, and there's it's nothing scary. that they can do to turn off an ICBM on its way, right? Absolutely not. Not no one's ever. There's no self-destruct mechanism uh, on board. Which actually, come to think of it, there should be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Although I guess then, from their point of view, that would make it vulnerable to hacking and and that kind of deal. But um, yes, but well, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what they would think and say. Of course, and they would would minimize the risk that it would continue on its way and you know blow up Moscow or Beijing or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, yeah, this is a big revelation in uh, Dan Ellsberg's new book, uh, which I'm not quite finished with yet, The Doomsday Machine. But he talks about you know he was a nuclear war planner um, back yeah. in the day and how he just absolutely could not believe the nuclear war plans. Uh, as they were set when he started advising on this for the Pentagon and for the Rand Corporation, how if anything happens anywhere, there's a, a conventional battle breaks out in Berlin or something, then every Chinaman and every Russian dies, all of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, automatically, pretty much automatically. Yeah, yeah. and no way to turn uh, it off. And and I guess he no he tried to, to change that, but you report in here that they changed it back. That any war with Russia means we're going to go ahead and take out all of China too. Right. Well, there's several things happened. One was, or well, just to deal with the China thing first. When China became our friend in the early '80s, and we you know Jimmy, we normalized relations and had ambassadors and all that good stuff. They took China out of the war plan. Like we don't need to kill every single. Chinese inhabitant of China anymore. Then in the 90s, under the Clinton administration, Clinton okayed a new nuclear posture, which uh, out at Omaha, at Offutt Air Force Base, which is the home of Strategic Command. Mm, This is where George Bush Jr. ran to hide all day long on September 11, 2001, deep underground in Nebraska. Well done, well Uh done. Yes, indeed, indeed. Anyway, even deeper underground was the the Joint Strategic Targeting, Target Planning Staff, I think is the proper name. So they read in the, or, you know, they read, they got a document saying Clinton's changed the nuclear posture in whatever way. And they said, aha, this means that China's our enemy again, which it didn't really say that, but they chose to interpret it that way. So they put China back in the war plan. So once again, if anything anything sort of broke out, 
you know, up goes China in a, you know, in a big puff of smoke. Isn't that funny? <laughs> Where it's just like anything else, right? Congress passes a law and then the FCC decides to interpret it this way or that way. Or whatever. These guys That's get to right. do that with nuclear war plans and presidential orders. Right. Um, but not only that, at least if, you know, good example with the FCC, but at least Congress might know that, that that has happened. Uh-huh. You know, people would write about it. In this case, uh, um, Clinton, the White House didn't know that this had happened, that we were going to kill a billion Chinese until Bruce Blair, my, who, my informant who told me about this, he was on a trip to Omaha and he was chatting with the general in charge who casually mentioned that they'd put China back in what's called the single integrated operational plan. And he, when he got back to Washington, he called up the White House and said, you might like to know that this has happened. They had no idea. Uh, Incredible. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's something Ellsberg talks about, too, where Jack Kennedy said, I want to see the war plan, and they told him no. And then they said, okay, we will, but then they showed him something that was not the war plan at all. And he was the president of the United States, and they told him to go to hell. You're not cleared to see this. Yeah, but even then, there are layers and layers, because it turned out that the war plan, you know, okay, so the war eventually, you know, I think since Kennedy's time, they did the White House did get to see well to see a war plan, which was not the war plan. The Joint Chiefs back and over at the Pentagon, they had what they considered the real war plan, mm-hmm. which they wouldn't show the civilian leadership. Uh, but that wasn't the real war plan either. The real war plan was the one that was being drawn up deep in the base, you know, many layers down at Offutt Air Force Base. So, for example, uh, you talked about Ellsberg just now. Ellsberg. You know, he was so horrified. He and others were so horrified by this, you know, scheme that you outlined. You know, which was anything happens. You know, a tank, a tank backfires in Berlin, and we instantly push the big red button and blow off the entire world. They were horrified by that, so they worked hard to get that plan modified. So we got, for various reasons, we got the counterforce. Uh, plans, which was you know great different options. Like for example, the president could say would be have the option saying, okay, we're just going to fire nuclear missiles at the Russian nuclear missiles and other big important military bases, bomber bases, and so forth, and we won't blow up their cities. Okay, so that, that improvement might you know sort of makes saves a few hundred million Russians, uh, a few t- tens of millions of Russians at least. But meanwhile, uh, at Offutt. <laughs> They didn't think too much of this scheme. So they found military targets in the cities or very close to the cities. So there were, you know, around Moscow. So Moscow itself wasn't targeted, maybe. No, no, no. But there were plenty of multi-megaton aim points around, you know, just around the outskirts. So it meant Moscow would have been, in the words of, you know, a, a history of this, completely obliterated. Every Soviet city... Even if the president said, we are not going to blow up, you know, we're going to withhold the city targets, we're not going to blow them up, and we're just going to go for military targets, even then, every single Soviet city would be would have been obliterated. You know, um, there's an anecdote about, uh, and this is when the USSR still existed, when Dick Cheney was being sworn in as Secretary of Defense in 1989 under George H.W. Bush, that he was briefed on the war plans, and at some point, even Dick Cheney started squirming in his seat and just said, this is insane. How many H-bombs can we hit Moscow with in a row? I mean, what are we trying to dig down to the center of the earth or something? There's nothing left to blow up there after the first 50 have gone off. Right, right, right. And well, it really found, makes you uh, wonder about... This, and I, this is what you talk about really in the article, how so much of this has to do with the structure. I mean, I guess I'll put off the incentive structure about the generals and the presidents and all that the way you, you do it. But what's the incentive in the bureaucratic structure that makes them write a war plan like that, where not only do we find a loophole where we really want to drop an H-bomb on Moscow, but as you say in here, Moscow itself could be subject to a hundred nuclear explosions I mean, what that's is the today. sense and that's i get it they're like yeah. okay the submarine officers they want in on this too but still that's how do you get to a hundred well i here's how i think it works um it's it all start i mean i my belief in under, the only way to understand all this is money think about the money um 
so you have all these interests, interest in producing missiles, interest in producing warheads, interest in you know, devising plans for all this, interest in producing you know, bombers and all that. Okay, so we want to produce, you know, to keep the Lockheed or the General Dynamics or Corporation or whoever, keep them happy and profitable. Um, you know, we want to put place an order for, you know, umpty ump, 100, you know, 400 missiles. Okay. Um, okay, so now we have to find, well, how do we justify this? Well, we have to find targets for them. Uh, and the basic rule, as I recall, was you had, they just, they made, wrote this rule for themselves. So we have to be able to cover 80% of the, our assigned targets, even, you know, under any circumstances. So that meant you needed to have, you know, a huge excess of, of the, you know, of of of, um, of missile delivery vehicles and warheads. So it all it all starts from the need to find targets for these devices because you need to find excuses to buy them. Uh, so once you've done that, then you have to scratch around and say, well, you know, we can we can drop a megaton bomb or warhead on this entrance to the Kremlin. But maybe there's a point not 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 one percent chance that the other entrants would still would survive. So we better send another megaton bomb on that. Uh, you see what I mean? So it's all it's all a matter of finding excuses. The whole drive of the bureaucracy mm -hmm. is to think of excuses to find targets for these bombs on right. mid wires. And this is why we as Americans have the right to do this and to hold the whole world hostage with this H bomb sword of Damocles over all of their yeah. necks is because we are so moral and guided by such American virtue that they better just bow down. They have no argument against it, even though this is the actual morality of the American empire. They'll nuke Moscow a hundred times. Well, right. And uh, we know they'll, Basically, so that someone can make some money. I mean, we'll target them, and we might end up doing it. And it's, um, you know, this is, I said that, that, as I mentioned, now it's 100 aim points in Moscow alone or around Moscow. Uh, today, this is, well, we, I guess we have a new Cold War now, but, uh, you know, that's been, we, the Cold War ended, you know, the big Cold War ended in 1991 or 1990, whenever you want to date it. Um, and we said, that's great. And we, you know, the bombers were taken off alert. It looked for a moment like peace might break out. But they, you know, the essential machinery of, you know, nuclear destruction carried on, you know, carried on. There were still people sitting in the silos, still people sitting in the bunkers, drawing up target lists. You know, this, this, this deadly machine, mega death machine, carried on, um, even though, you know, we were, at least for a while, you know, friends with Russia. And by the way, you know, it's absurd that there should be this obsession with Russia where the Russian defense, the total Russian defense budget, which is roughly thought to be $61 billion or the equivalent of that, is less than the amount the U.S. defense budget has gone up this year. You know, it's ridiculous. Absolutely, it is. Well, it's not supposed to be realistic. <laughs> it's just supposed to be convincing. But those are different things. In fact, um, I don't remember the name of the article, but we talked before and you wrote a great article uh, for Harper's back a couple of two or three years ago about a, a big celebration in Crystal City where a bunch of arms manufacturers are meeting. And they're so excited that, you know what, you know, we made a lot of money bombing peasants in Afghanistan and Iraq and this kind of thing. But the real money is in the big ticket items, bombers yeah. and jets and all the stuff that we need for a Cold War with Russia. And they all figure that, oh, don't worry, we won't all die under fusing hydrogen atoms. It'll be perfectly cool. But what a, you know, great way to yeah. make money without having to work, really, for them. Yeah, I mean, it was um, that the actual incident I described in that piece, uh, I remember, was um, it was the day Putin took over Crimea. Oh, right. And a friend of mine happened to be attending a breakfast. He was a lobbyist, and he was attending a breakfast. He wasn't actually a defense lobbyist, but he happened to be there at this meeting with a, uh, I think it was, what's he called, Mike Royce, who was head of the Intelligence Committee. And the rest, everyone else in the room was a defense industry lobbyist. And I, he said, oh, I met him that day. I said, he said he'd been there. And I said, oh, you know, what was it like? And he said, I'd describe the, mu the mood as borderline euphoric. Right. 
They Amazing. were just so happy that you know. Yeah, otherwise uh, they'd have to get real jobs. So they have to get real jobs. Yeah, people might uh, <laughs> exactly. Um, which yeah. is not, you know, it's people. It's so I'm so glad we're talking about this because it's so hard to get across to people that this is all about money. It's all about keeping the economy afloat. You know, yeah. basically what's left of the U.S. manufacturing base is mostly defense. Uh, um, and that's, you know, we need a Cold War. We need all this to keep to keep the show on the road. Yeah, we have a wartime economy because that's all we have left of an economy. And exactly because so. we have a wartime economy, because so yeah, much of our... Exactly. This is what David Stockman calls the great deformation, where... Yeah. It's a massive bubble um, toward, you know, basically bending the entire economy toward militarism. And then all these other little bubbles, dot-com bubble here, housing bubble there, those are the little bubbles on yeah. top of the big bubble. Exactly. You put it very well. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, well, and um, let's hope it doesn't take H-bombs to pop the damn thing. <laughs> but <laughs> Yeah, that's really it. I'm, I'm getting pretty scared, i got to tell you. I mean, this hysteria that's on now, I must say, has me quite frightened. Yeah, you know, um, Pat Buchanan makes this point. I, I brought this up in the last interview. Sorry, audience, but I like it. Um, Pat Buchanan said, you know, the line was drawn during the Cold War. that If the Russians, and, and in your book, The Threat, you showed what a joke this was, but still... If the Soviets tried to roll their tanks into western Germany, cross the Elbe River, then we would go to nuclear war. Don't you right. dare try to conquer western Europe. But you uh, crush an American-provoked uprising in Hungary or in Czechoslovakia. You crush solidarity in Poland. You know what? We're really sorry, guys, but that's just too far outside of our sphere of influence. We're not going to go to a nuclear war over Prague. Or over Warsaw. And yet, now we've moved that line from the Elbe River all the way to the Russian border. Not that, yes. not that the Russians really have a plan to reconquer Eastern Europe anyway. But it seems like we're trying to give them a motive to do so. To rebuild that uh, Stalinist uh, you know, cushion um, of, of the borderlands. Of uh, particularly uh, Poland and the Baltic states. Uh, to keep them as a shield to keep the West out. Now we've moved all the way to, to you know, you talk about the accidents and the close calls. How itchy must the Russian trigger finger be right now when we have troops right on their border? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You know, that was, as you say, that was the excuse all the years of the Cold War. I mean, Cold War One, let's call it. Cold yeah. War One. Uh, uh, that, you know, we had to, you know, the Russians were poised to invade Western Europe and we, therefore, we, you know, we offered the guarantee that we would blow up Russia if they tried to do it. You know, after, as I mentioned in the article, um, right after the end of Cold War One, in the sort of brief sunshine period when uh, you could do such things, the there was a people at think tank or a research institute, the BDM Corporation, um, got a contract from the Pentagon to go over and talk to Russian national security types about what they, you know, what they've been thinking during, you know, during the Cold War. And there were all these very interesting interviews, including where they said, we never had the slightest intention of invading Western Europe. It never even crossed our mind to even think of such a thing. So the whole justification for the whole, you know, huge part of the whole nuclear posture was all completely spurious, you know, that mm -hmm. the... And that's, um, you know, there's a guy, the sort of hero of my article, one of the heroes or the hero of mine is uh, a guy called Lee Butler. I talk about him in the article who mm -hmm. was, he rose to the very top of the American nuclear war machine. He was head of strategic air command and head of STRATCOM. And then even while he was in the job, but certainly after he left, he started to think this is all, you know, he realized it's all complete madness. Uh, and he, you know, since has gone around, campaigning against, you know, for the total abolition of nuclear weapons. And he says the whole idea of deterrence is completely stupid. Everyone says, well, you know, deterrence, yes, we have to have, you know, made the means to deter the Russians. Well, actually, he, say, he points out that, you know, the idea of deterrence is, you know, I, if Scott Horton, you know, thinks he's going to, you know, put a nuclear bomb in my car, you know, I'm going to he has to know that I'm going to 
put a nuclear bomb in his car. Um, that's the terror. But actually, that assumes that I know that Scott Horton, what well, Scott Horton is thinking, and that I know that Scott Horton knows what I'm thinking. In other words, you're judging, prejudging everyone's reactions. And he said, you can never do that. You have no idea what the other guy's thinking, especially not someone in a completely different... He says, you know, so the whole, the whole premise is false of deterrence. Mm -hmm. Well, um, and you know, and they he, say that deterrence, the point of deterrence is that we can't just destroy, it's not just that we can defeat your army, but we can, you know, evaporate your capital city. And so all the people in charge of starting the war, their lives are now at risk too. Right, and right, yet right, right. we could bomb the hell out of Moscow without nukes. <laughs> anyway, yeah. we got daisy cutters and Moabs and all kinds of things that we could slaughter plenty of Russians without actually uh, splitting or fusing atoms together. Sure. Sure, uh, sure. When it sure. comes to just deterrence, you know what I mean? We could still burn your capital city down. Don't worry about that. Ask the Vietnamese, they'll tell you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, we're, we're pretty good at that. Off the, off the Yemenis. Yeah. Um, so, um, now let's talk a little bit about uh, what you say about how they changed the structure from. Uh, from whichever the Stratcom command post to the different one, where now it's higher ranking people um, yeah. are the ones who get the intelligence and are responsible for communicating with the president. And that perhaps unintentionally, I think you're saying that this actually makes the ability for the military to sort of box the president in and force him to start a nuclear war, to jam him uh, into yeah. starting a nuclear war, uh, it changes the incentives there compared to the way it was before. Could you explain that a little bit? Sure. Um, the way it was before, um, for a long time, was um, the early, well, initially the heat, heat sensing satellites we have over Russia and Siberia at all times. They sent they see Russian missiles coming through the clouds, uh, you know, from the bases in Siberia. Okay, uh, they then, um, like a minute later, the early warning radars in England and Greenland and wherever else they are, they were the main ones. They pick up, you know, they confirm that the Russian missiles are on the way. So then, where it used to be, those warning, that early warning center would report this to uh, NORAD, the North American Air Defense Command, whose headquarters were inside a mountain, Cheyenne Mountain in Colorado, outside, uh, I think it's outside Colorado Springs. Mm -hmm. They would then, you know, say whoops, and then they would call the Pentagon War Room, uh, the National Military Command Center, which is sort of underneath the Pentagon, uh, and they would then whoever was in charge there would then call the White House and wake up the president and, you know, talk to the national security advisor and say, you know, you Russian missiles are on the way. You now have six minutes to decide what to do about it. So what they've done, and this happened under the first, under George W. Bush, is they basically they cut out NORAD. Oh, yeah, so they, I should explain that in the guy in the war room in the National Military Command Center he would normally be a colonel. So he's got to decide whether or not to wake up the president. If you're just a colonel, it's kind of a big deal. Um, so you might sort of, you know, take a few seconds, you know, half a minute or even a minute to sort of get it confirmed to think about it. Anyway, this is what I was told. So they streamlined it. So now, once the satellites, the, the you know, the radars have confirmed what... Um, you know, that the missiles are on their way, they immediately call, that immediately goes to Stratcom uh, in, o in Omaha and almost immediately goes to the commanding officer there or his deputy, but the commanding officer is a four-star general. He then calls the president, and he's a four-star general. They're like gods in the, in the military. Uh, so he has, you know, no inhibitions about waking up the president uh, and says the missiles are on their way, and what do you propose to do about it? And, you know, you know, then the president can say, well, you know, might say nothing, but probably not. And he's going to say, OK, we'll do, you know, option two, whatever that means, you know, blow up the Soviet Russian military. Um, 
and the president then gives the order. Okay, so this all, you know, when Trump came along, people started to get nervous about the idea of Donald Trump, you know, in the position to push the button. So they asked, there was a congressional where they asked the head of, former head of STRATCOM, a guy called Kayla, they said, if the president gives you know, the wrong order, so it says blow up the world, but you think that's not a good idea, what could you do about it? And he said, well, I would refuse to carry it out, or worse to that effect. And then they asked the same question at a, some kind of security forum of the present head of STRATCOM, uh, General Hyten. And he said, I would you know, refuse to carry out that order. I would tell him what he could do. Well, that all sounded good and a big relief. And okay, we got these, you know, these senior military officers who would who were prepared to mutiny rather than start a nuclear war for the wrong reasons. The cool was starting a nuclear war for the right reasons, uh, whatever they might be. Mm-hmm. But they, you know, they would draw the line somewhere. And everyone that was taken as a, you know, good reason, grounds for complacency. Except that what no one said, I point out in the piece. Actually, the president doesn't need these guys to start a nuclear war. He has the once he issues the order using the special codes that he is who he says he is, you know that um, so you or I can't get hold of those codes and uh, you know give the order. So the president has sort of fail-safe methods of identifying himself. The thing happens automatically. It's nothing to do with the head of track call. So it's uh, in fact one guy who was very close to the whole. So wait, I mean, what you're saying is, so Stratcom basically by moving the command authority around um, and and putting it in the hands of Stratcom, that gives them a, basically makes it easier for them to alarm and alert the president and try to convince him to do something. But on the other hand, right. if the president yeah. wants to go ahead and do something crazy without them, there's nothing that they could do to stand in his way anyway. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and furthermore, it used to be the only scenario anyone could still think of would be, you know, Russian missiles, you know, coming through the clouds over Siberia. And, you know, that at least you, you know how long it's going to take for them to get here. You can pretty figure out pretty quickly figure out where they're all headed. Um, and that's, you know, gives a degree of certainty about the whole thing. But now they're saying, and this is, you know, is a good excuse for an even bigger defense budget. Oh, all these other people have missiles now, the North Koreans, the Pakistanis, the Iranians, uh, not, you know, which is a bit unrealistic. And they not only have missiles, but these are, these are missiles that can not come on a, you know, a direct trajectory. They can maneuver. And the Russians, you know, they can, they can you know, head off, you know, take off and head left and then turn right. Uh, so um, and it makes it more uncertain. So you have to alert the president earlier. And not even you don't even have to wait for the missiles to take off. Supposing we have hard intelligence that they might be about to launch a nuclear missile, a weapon of mass destruction in our direction, that might be in our direction, then you wake up the president. So, you know, I say that they light the fuse earlier, which is a lot scarier. I mean, this is all total hokum because I don't think obviously no one's going to do that, but it it raises the, you know, anyone's going to launch a missile at us. But supposing. You know, I was talking to a congressman, Congressman Ted Lieu of California, and I said, well, what do you think about them, you know, reacting to intelligence of an imminent strike? And he said, well, there was a good intelligence that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, wasn't there? You know, uh, and um, it turned out there, there wasn't. But we, you know, we invaded a country, killed hundreds of thousands of people, including thousands of Americans, for false intelligence. So it's quite possible to conceive of what's blowing up the world on equally false intelligence. Mm -hmm. All right, Charlie, here's who sponsors this show. Mike Swanson, author of The War State, The Rise of the Military-Industrial Complex in America After World War II. It's just great. And also he gives investment advice at wallstreetwindow.com. Subscribe there. And uh, when you do, you'll want to follow his advice and buy some precious metals for your savings. You go to Roberts & Roberts Brokerage, Inc., rrbi.co, and tell them Scott sent you. Read No Dev, No Ops, No IT by Hussein Badakhchani. How to run your IT business like a libertarian. Zencash at Zencash.com or Zensystem.io and TheBumperSticker.com. Stickers for your band or your business or whatever you need. TheBumperSticker.com. 
And if you want a new 2018 model website and you want to save some money, go to expanddesigns.com slash Scott and you'll save 500 bucks. Yeah, um, you know, there's the should be much more famous story, I guess, right, of the Able Archer exercise in 1983, where the Soviets really thought that it was cover for a first strike attack, that Reagan was going to launch a war, and it was a traitor, thank God, who was inside NATO, who was a secret Russian spy, who reported back to them, I swear to God, it's just an exercise, don't freak out, don't overreact, and so they didn't. Right, was that the guy, maybe I'm thinking the same guy, there was a guy called Gordievsky, Actually, he was in the KGB in London, and the, you know he turned and went over to the British. And he would told the British, he said, "Christ, you know, back in you know Moscow, they're really freaked out. They think the Americans are about to launch a first strike." So that that freaked out the British. So Margaret Thatcher actually called Ronald Reagan and said, "You better knock this off because the Russians are, are taking you very seriously." It's, I think that's the same story. I'm I not see. sure, but it's a, yeah. It sounds yeah. like you got a, a lot more straight than I do. I need to go back and look at that. But so yeah. they did. They ended up doing the exercise, but at least with some reassurances or something, right? Yeah, I, I forgot what they did, but they did. They did tone it down a bit. And remember, Ronald Reagan used to make jokes about mm-hmm. bombing Russia. Well, that was the uh, thing, right? Is he would say, "Yeah, the bombing starts in five minutes," and then, yeah. you know, basically, you can imagine a bunch of, you know the Russian counterparts to the American hysterics, the kind of thing that we're hearing right now, where they might refuse to take that as a joke, even though, come on, it's just Ronald Reagan screwing around, dude. He's not really going to start bombing, but there's always going to be somebody who says, hey, that's secret code for he really means it, you know? Yeah. And look at the, look at the way the Americans are overreacting to Russia doing basically nothing right now, you know? Yeah. 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 I mean, you remember the, as I mentioned the article, the, um, the Russians came up with this, you know, dead hand system. They called it perimeter, uh, by which if if sensors detected a nuclear attack, I mean, actually bombs going off, then the Russian missiles would launch automatically, right? Pretty much without human intervention. There was sort of one human link in the chain, but not a very, you know, that that was it. It was easily bypassed. Um, so, uh, and, you know, we know sensors can get things wrong all the time. <laughs> so that was pretty scary, the idea that we were all dependent on a Russian sensor or a bunch of Russian sensors working properly. Yeah, man. And do we know, have they at least said that they turned that off and it's no longer the system, or is that it's still the, the... Yeah, it's a bit fuzzy, but it looks like they have, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you know, it's funny, man, um, this... Uh, all this stuff about uh, Russia now and with Donald Trump in there, um, you know, I could he's mostly a hawk. Uh, right. And yet going back to like 1986 or something, he said he wanted Ronald Reagan to send him over there to do a nuclear deal with Gorbachev. And he seems to always, you know, that could be the deal of the century. Right. The one that Reagan almost made at Reykjavik in 89 to go ahead and abolish all of the American and Russian nuclear arsenals. And then we can get to work on our allies, too. And um, and really create a nuclear free world. And it's the kind of thing that could get him reelected if he could do it. And yet there's instead we have this entire it's just complete, you know, Iraq War two level insanity about what's going on with Russia and how they're his secret Manchurian uh, brainwash yeah. masters and all of this stuff. Yeah. So anything he tries to do like that, I mean, hell, just being on TV next to Putin is treason. So what would they call yeah, it yeah, if yeah. he if he signed on to the Democrats' New START treaty? You know what I mean? They'd call it treason, yeah. right? Of course, of course. Yeah, at least at least he's, <laughs> he's got a bit more reasonable. He told someone I know a while back with long before. I mean, I've gotten when twenty years ago. He said this is who was nego- involved in negotiating um, arms control treaties with the Russians. I guess it was like must have been back in the Bush administration. Um, or even earlier, he said, um, here's how you negotiate with the Russians. You turn up, you wait, you have a negotiating session set up. You turn up, you wait, and you turn up half an hour late so they're getting really pissed. And then you walk in and you go up to the chief Russian negotiator and say, (laughs) phew. That'll work. (laughs) As a, Sheldon Richmond said, yeah, everybody's mad at Trump for not putting a pie in Putin's face or yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. kicking and pushing Sorry, him down not, the stairs or something. The re- 
Am I not meant to say that on the radio? I apologize. Oh, yeah. Nah, that's fine. We'll, just, we'll, we'll cut out the k, but everyone will know what you said. It'll be great. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, expletive deleted. Yeah, you know what you do? What you do is you karate chop them right in the throat, and then they'll do whatever you want. Yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, at least he didn't do that to Putin. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, the thing is, too, right, is um, we haven't had a real war here in so long. What, 170 years now or something like that? Um, yeah. The Russians, they have a little bit different experience. And they tend to look yeah. at things a little bit different than the Americans when it comes to protecting themselves, huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. They have a very... Uh, I mean, I mean like, even when we had a war here, it was just North versus South. We hadn't been invaded since your great-great-grandfather burnt the White House in 1812, which, congratulations that, on that, by the way. <laughs> he, and I always have to say, he did it with an army of freed slaves. Right. Uh, or at least part of his army were freed slaves. Take that, Mr. Madison. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly so. But that really was the last time that the U.S. was attacked, and that was when the U.S., you know, barely reached past the Appalachian Mountains. That's right. That's right. Um, the Russians, on the other hand, they've been invaded how many times? Well, let's see. Once, twice, uh, three times. I mean... Very, de you know, with de very, very devastating consequences, um, you know, three times in the last 200 years, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. 250 years. Okay. Yeah. But, so, you um, know, we're, we're, yeah. I mean, people said people who are a lot better experts than me have said that, hey, this really matters to the Russians. They're terrified. And that, that was really what was behind Stalin, you know, uh, continuing to occupy all of Eastern Europe after World War Two was to just keep right. the Germans and the Americans out to give, you know, let a bunch of Poles and Estonians be the, quote, darky shield to protect the Russians in the event of an invasion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. So exactly right. Yeah, I mean, you could see why they'd be a little bit paranoid, a little bit, and and you look at how paranoid the Americans are. Multiply that by however many invasions, right? Yeah, that's yeah, crazy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one more set of questions here. What about the new? Uh, it was a trillion dollar program. They're already saying one point something, and it'll surely be a three trillion dollar program by the time they're done yes. to completely revamp the nuclear weapons arsenal and industry and weapons labs and everything in this country um i guess it's a pretty big bargaining chip to bargain away in in exchange for some pretty big russian concessions but doesn't really look like we're headed that way oh no completely zero chance zero possibility that uh, that any uh you know any president who tried to sign such a treaty would be impeached immediately, as Trump probably will be. Not, you know, there's plenty of really, really good reasons to impeach Trump, but I don't think this is one of them. But yeah. Still. yeah, if they do overthrow him, it'll be over some BS like this, trying to make peace with the Russians or with the North Koreans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Um, and you know yeah, what? I, as long as we're on that, do you really think that they're, you know, that he might be uh, thrown out of power before the next election? Uh, before the midterms? Or, no, or I mean before, before uh, 2020. I mean, I guess I'm worried I mean, that there's going to be, if I'd they say, really try I'd, it, that it could really get out of control with the reactions to that, you know? Yeah, I think not. But, I mean, there's, you never say never, you know. Um, I don't think I don't think it's likely. I really don't. Yeah. Uh, well, that's good. I mean, um, Lord knows that all they got uh, Nixon over, it wasn't the secret bombing of Cambodia. It was... You know, a break in at the Watergate. So, um, right. you know, as long fact, as they have real exactly, stuff to uh, impeach him for, they won't, I guess. Yeah, exactly. 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 They'll need some but trumped the, up uh, charge. The, the important, I mean, yeah, the, you may, I'm glad you mentioned the, you know, the defense, the whole nuclear so called modernization, you know, re complete rebuild. Um, you know, that's what it's all about. You know, it's, you know, we have the, def and I should mention, I mentioned in the article, that there's someone of John Wolfstall, who was the senior nuclear guy or sort of weapons, you know, bomb proliferation person on the um, in the Obama National Security Council staff. He told me that um, he tried to get, or the White House, you know, the Obama White House tried to get the Pentagon to come up with a number for what our nuclear forces cost us every year, and the Pentagon refused to tell them. 
They said, <laughs> well, we, we don't have that figure. It'd be too hard to figure it out. Too yeah. hard. <laughs> well, you know, um, uh, Robert Higgs uh, at the Independent Institute and uh, what's that guy's name? Charles something. who was really good a few years ago at one of these institutes in D.C., I forget. And then I think Mother Jones magazine also did it, uh, a review of this where they said that if you combine the military budget with the energy department and all the cost of the care and feeding of the nuclear weapons and the V.A., we're at a trillion dollars a year. So oh, uh, yeah, yeah, there are outside yeah, yeah. estimates of that, at least. But Yeah, no, that's 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 that's. All, that's might be a moderate figure because you know we've got the defense budget which is north of 700 billion mm -hmm. then you've got the energy department which is all the nuclear weapons then you've got the um the va uh then you've got you should include the uh you know the state department not that that's much but i mean certainly part of our national security apparatus mm -hmm. and then you've got the interest on the money that we borrowed to pay for all this right well and the cost of the cia is how many b tens of billions a year or hundreds yeah well that's that's hidden in hidden inside the um the, Def the pentagon budget mm -hmm. so yeah uh, imagine what it would be like if we had that money to spend making america great again instead of threatening uh, the whole on, world dream on dream on <laughs> All right, Andrew, thanks for coming back on the show. I really appreciate it. Scott, always a pleasure. All right, you guys, that is the great Andrew Coburn. you got to read his book, Kill Chain, about the drone wars, et cetera. It's so good. And check out this great article at harpers.org, How to Start a Nuclear War. All right, y'all, that's it for the show. Check me out at libertarianinstitute.org, scotthorton.org, antiwar.com, twitter.com, slash scotthortonshow. Appreciate it. And buy my book, Fool's Errand, Timed and the War in Afghanistan.